Hello everyone um, and welcome to uh, the summer series session on motivation. Um, it's a honour and a privilege to get to spend some time with you this afternoon um, on what is a slightly greyer afternoon than we've been used to. Caroline, I see you've got a good tan there. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. Gardening. <laughs> Glad to get it in now back at school. Good. Well, well done for getting it in. Um, it looks like the weather is set to change, sadly, um, but uh, yeah, probably could be good for the garden, if nothing else. Um, so, yes, thank you very much, everyone who has joined. Um, it's, a, a, like I said, a privilege to get to spend some time with you uh, this afternoon talking about motivation. Uh, it is something that we are both very passionate about and have been reading and thinking about for many years. And um, the plan today is basically to give you a bit of a whirlwind tour of what the evidence tells us about motivation in schools and also then what that might look like in terms of implications for our practice um, both during this lockdown phase uh, in the return to school when that happens uh, so that's currently already happening and beyond life beyond um, so that by the end of today you will have an understanding of like what motivation really is and how you can influence it um, but first why should you listen to us about this who are we um yeah and so i'm gonna kick off actually so i'm gonna introduce caroline so this is caroline spalding um wonderful to have caroline with us today and um, she is an incredibly experienced teacher and um, has worked has taught for 14 years in a variety of schools i think in every ofsted category and currently a an assistant head teacher in a all through school that serves a, a catchment of high deprivation and has tried and tested a lot of the things that we're going to be talking about today. So there's a real uh, sense of, of kind of credibility and, and experience that comes through. Uh, Caroline's also a like, Women Ed Network lead, a SLD chat leader, a DFE advisor, um, you name it, she is uh, giving out advice. Uh, or we are all very grateful for her advice whenever she's around. Um, and finally, worth noting that uh, Caroline is a huge wrestling fan. Last summer, she traveled to Japan just to see a wrestling match, but I have it on good advice that she does not accept individual resting challenges uh, at the moment. Over to you, Caroline. Right, so um, Peps is also a very experienced teacher, with which I think is, again, really important when we're talking about these seemingly quite academic areas of education. So seven years as teacher, including head of department, senior leader, and seven years as a senior lecturer. He's got three master's degrees, which is quite staggering, and is currently completing his doctorate looking at teacher expertise. Um, PEPS leads learning design for the teaching programmes at Ambition, and that's actually where our paths crossed. So I'm delighted to say I'm currently on the Future Leaders programme, just completing the, second, the first year, going to the second. Yeah. Um, absolutely, um, hugely valuable for me, both in terms of professional learning, but also the networks that I've established. And if it wasn't for that, actually, I wouldn't be sat here doing this webinar. Um, I did corner perhaps at the end of the day looking at motivation <laughs> with a pint of beer um, and that is as I said how I sat on this chair so Peps also is a prolific writer, he's written three books um, and it has a book soon to come out on this very topic, um, motivation and I've been lucky enough to see an advanced copy of that I can honestly say if you are interested in things we're going to talk about please do get it on your kind of Amazon wish list or wherever you buy your books um, because no genuinely it's a really readable guide to a lot of the topics that we're going to be talking about. Great thank you Caroline um, and just to say like that is where all the best conversations start don't they in a pub um, which you know is, is a real privilege especially when we uh, are able to get together or were as part of the ambition programs. Just a quick note on who Ambition is for those people who are new uh, to your organisation. Ambition Institute is an educational charity um, that has the mission to help school leaders and teachers to keep getting better and um, particularly those that serve uh, disadvantaged communities. Um, we run professional development programs for teachers and leaders at every stage of their career and um, from new teachers all the way up to multi-academy CEOs. Uh, and I suppose this session is part of a summer series, a programme of webinars that we are putting on uh, across the summer to help you uh, as educators through and beyond the coronavirus pandemic. Um, Caroline, I'm going to hand over to you to talk a little bit, to set the scene a little bit. What is the problem that we are currently facing? Absolutely. So we've obviously set um, motivation against our current con reopening, as you know, as I say, I'm currently sat back in my 
from school. Then, you know, it's that old trope, isn't it, of the year nine bottoms out on Friday, period five, when it's windy outside. Um, there's a quote at the beginning of Pep's new book by Mary Kennedy, which says, education is mandatory, but learning is not. And if you've ever tried to perhaps motivate, dare I say it, teenagers, I'm all three, but I leave key stage four, then perhaps you'll know that what actually is backed up by the evidence that motivation is variable and it varies not just between pupils but actually between different contexts so, you know it's highly context dependent there's also some evidence that suggests that motivation decreases throughout pupils school career so you know one question that has come up previously was actually around a particular year groups you know why is it that actually year 10 and year 11 seem less motivated than our year sevens when they come in um, but having said all that, the issues that we perhaps are used to as educators are likely to be exacerbated by this lockdown, um, which we've been, I don't want to say enduring, but I think that probably is quite the right word. So obviously school closed on the 20th of March and we've been faced with a number of quite unique challenges. So I think there's an image perhaps on the slides that we were going to share of, of a letterbox. And this will be kind of one of my enduring images, I think, of lockdown. Um, so within my, my own school, um, we've got many people, about 40% who don't have access to internet, reliable internet or a suitable device for home learning. So we've been creating all of these paper-based home learning packs. We're now over 300, I think. Um, and in some cases we've had to go out and we've kind of had to hand deliver these packs. And I will always remember these little tiny hands kind of reaching out through the letterbox towards us because there was so much fear of even opening the door. Um, to, to somebody else from outside of the home to collect this pack and obviously this is kind of as I say humour very so much this memorable image and almost the sort of joy I have to say of seeing these these children thinking in what's quite an, a creative way but for me that that image of the door of space really symbolises the separation and the anxiety um, that we've all had to face during this really strange unusual dare I say it unprecedented time you know we quite literally haven't known what's going on behind the door and you know, first and foremost, that's got real safeguarding issues um, for every school leader, but also in terms of that home learning, um, you know, we've really had to think about how we maintain communication to find out what is going on. So the particular barriers that I'd, I'd kind of say that link to motivation, I think the next slide perhaps has got um, a bit of a summary of these. So first of all, you know, even if pupils are engaged with home learning, then we're certainly going to be facing a loss of curriculum time and correlative low attainment for pupils. You know, we can't necessarily get back or try and recreate those months of learning that pupils have been at home. And we know that low attainment can impact on pupils' motivation. Second of all, many of our pupils will be facing a lack of structure and routine. So, you know, whether that's as simple as getting out of the bed later on, but also those, those transitions that we're so used to as educators from lesson one to lesson two, from break time to their form tutor period. Um, and again, that's definitely linked to, we know, motivation. There's also likely been a weakening of social norms and behaviours, so it's highly unlikely that they've been seeing their peer group. And therefore, there's also likely to have been a weakening of social ties. Um, and, you know, that's, again, as an adult, I've been struggling with not being able to see my friends in a similar way. You know, the Zoom chats, the Zoom quizzes on a Friday night just aren't quite the same, are they? And then last of all, you know, even adults, I'm sure, have felt a sense of a loss of agency, you know, a lack of control and actually not being certain about where things are headed. Um, and that ties in with a lack of a kind of sense of purpose. You know, if I'm not doing my, my usual day to day routine, actually, what, what am I doing? But if motivation was already an issue in school, as I've said, you know, before lockdown, why is it that we can't just apply the same tools? You know, why haven't we cracked it yet? So perhaps over to you for this bit. Why is it very difficult to use science, you know, all those tools that we hope that we have as research engaged educators to tackle motivation? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good, good question and an important question, Caroline, actually, because um, we need to understand why we're in the situation we're in if we're going to uh, be able to change things for the better and I'd say like the the root of the problem for for me looking across the evidence and thinking about this problem for many years is that motivation itself is a largely complex and invisible thing which just really doesn't help us at all um, I suppose our motivation the mechanics of our motivation evolved over millennia 
in response to uh, in an environment where resources were scarce, the outcomes of our actions were often unpredictable, and collaboration and competition were, all, were in this really delicate kind of trade-off balance. Um, and so, like, there are just a huge number of factors that come to play whenever our motivation is concerned, and so it's just a really complex thing to wrap our heads around. The the impact of that kind of evolution of our motivation has meant that it's a very deeply wired thing in our brains and our biology. You know, motivation, our motivation influences at the level of our, our, our genes, of our synapses, and of our, our hormones. Um, as a result, it's, it's really quite hard to see. It's, it's in, largely invisible and unconscious, uh, or, or at least below levels of conscious awareness for most things. Like a lot of the decisions we make uh, that are driven by motivation are, are not ones that we're always aware of. So it's hard to figure out. We can't just open up some heads and have a look inside. Um, we can't easily use trial and error in the classroom to figure out what works and what doesn't. Um, and we can't even introspect our way to enlightenment because it's just not something that is uh, easy for us to reflect on. So experience by itself is just not enough. Like you say, we kind of need to draw on the science. Um, it's a bit like, and here's my uh, analogy, it's a bit like trying to peer under the, uh, or, or try to understand what's going on under the hood of a sports car. Um, uh, with the hood closed, it's, very, it's just too complex to figure out without actually uh, opening it up and having a look inside. And that's just what we're gonna do today. We're going to try and figure out what the science tells us about what motivation is and how to influence it. So let's just start with that first question, what motivation is. We're going to think about it, think about it through kind of four lenses as it were. And the first lens is that it's, a, it's useful to think of motivation as a mechanism for investing attention. And this matters for us in schools because we know that attention, what you attend to or what our pupils attend to is what they end up learning. And therefore, what they are motivated towards is what they end up attending to. And so uh, motivation is, or attention is the critical linkage between motivation and learning, which is why we need to pay attention to it ourselves. Um, so in terms of like a, a, an investment allocation or uh, an investment mechanism for investing attention, um, I suppose one way to think about it is that the classroom is a very busy place. There is lots going on that is competing for the attention of a 11-year-old you know, in, in the classroom. And their motivation is, is a kind of a, a mechanism that triages all of those op options or opportunities that are available to them and decides which is the best place to invest their attention. And so it's sort of an economic instrument in some ways, but as we'll see later, it's much more complex than the simple economics of our finances. Well, they're not even that simple these days. Um, okay, so second way to think about motivation is that it's, it's localized and malleable. Now, this is, what this means really is that um, instead of thinking about a child in school being motivated or not, you know, sometimes I've fallen into the trap of saying that, oh, you know, Peter's just not very motivated. The science suggests that motivation is much more localized and changeable, as in Peter can be motivated towards a particular thing on a particular day for a particular set of reasons and unmotivated towards other things for a particular set of reasons. So it really depends on the thing that we're talking about, whether it's seen as a good investment of attention or not, uh, and a whole bunch of other factors that influence that. So there's no such thing as just being motivated or not. It's about being motivated towards or against something for a particular reason. The next way of looking at motivation is to think about it as a largely unconscious response to the circumstances we find ourselves in. Um, like I said earlier, like motivation has been shaped over millennia, it's deeply hardwired. It's not something that we can necessarily uh, very easily reason people into thinking about. So uh, for example, me trying to reason with Caroline uh, why she should eat less biscuits in the evening um, is, is not going to work, whereas there's a bunch of other like levers we might be able to pull that will enable her to unconsciously make that decision to eat less biscuits. And again, we're gonna jump into those in a second. The, just, to, just for like transparency's sake here, the biscuit, the biscuit problem lies with me, not with Caroline. Um, if anybody has like any top tips, please feel free to share them with me another time. Um, okay, and then final thing, final way of like, final lens for thinking about motivation is that it is uh, a kind of an upstream cause of behavior. And so, um, in schools, I think there's an opportunity for us to be thinking more about behavior along, sorry, more about motivation alongside behavior. 
otherwise we kind of run the risk of just like sticking sticky plasters over symptoms rather than trying to treat the, like the root causes of the, the issues we see in school. Um, okay, so we've talked a little bit about what motivation is. How do we influence it? What does the science say about this? Okay, we're going to dive into five levers that the science suggests can be useful places to start. I'm going to start and then I'm going to hand over to Caroline who's going to pick up the baton um, as we go on to the hard stuff. Okay, so lever one, securing success. So we talked about motivation being this like way of investing the attention. And essentially we, uh, one of the, the things that influences where we invest attention is how much we perceive the opportunity to be of value. Now, one of the ways that we as educators can increase the value of what we're offering, because we can't really change it. We can't like swap out maths and say, hey, let's play Minecraft instead. Um, we, we, we're, we're here to teach maths because we, we believe it's valuable to society and that individual. Um, but what we've got to do is increase the perceived value of, of that, that the fractions lesson or whatever it is. And one of the best ways to do that is to secure success, to help people feel success over a period of time with fractions or whatever topic it is we're, we're, we're tackling. Um, because over time, success leads to proficiency and expectancy. And proficiency uh, is really just about you know, being good at something, knowing a lot about it, being smart about it, as Caroline would say. And when we achieve proficiency, we feel agency. We feel like we've got more control over the world. We feel more curious because the more we know, the more curiosity gaps exist in our brains. Uh, we feel awe because we get to experience the wonder of some of the, the subjects we learn in school. Um, and we get the positive feeling that comes with being fluent with something. Um, you all have things that we are fluent with and you all will know how good it, it feels when you, when, you do, when you use that knowledge and skills. Um, the other side of, of success, expectancy, as I, as I mentioned, is about um, having a sense of how likely it is that you're gonna get value from that experience. So if, for example, you have repeatedly experienced failure in the maths classroom at a very early age, it makes complete sense for you not to want to invest heavily in that going forward. Um, it would be crazy for you to feel really motivated given the past circumstance. And so it's imperative as teachers that we ensure that we secure success early and often. And as that success grows, then we can gradually increase the challenge and, um, and you know, make things even harder. Um, how do we secure success? Well, it basically comes down to good teaching in many ways. Um, so that means like pitching things well, breaking stuff down, explaining things clearly, and providing lots of scaffolding. And Mark Enser published a good blog a couple of weeks ago in the TES. Uh, check it out for more details. And then, of course, it's important to help our pupils understand what success looks like. Success for one person can be very different from, from, from success for another. And so we've almost got to uh, interpret and frame what success should mean for pupils. So tell them success looks like this. It doesn't necessarily look like this. And often we want to frame success as uh, getting better yourself rather than comparing your own success with others. Um, finally, worth saying that like, success and proficiency, I suppose more generally, is autocatalytic. What that means is it fuels itself. The more proficient you get, the more curious, the more interested, the more fluent, and the more motivated you become and the more you learn. So it really is uh, like one of the golden tickets in terms of motivation. However, success may be the biggest lever that we have to pull, but it's not the only one that contributes to that um, decision to invest attention as it were. All right, the second lever we're gonna look at uh, is routines, okay? And so when we're making an investment decision, we're not just interested in the, uh, the likelihood and the proficiency. Uh, we're also interested in how much this is going to cost us. How much effort are we going to have to put in to get this reward? Um, for example, I might say to Caroline, hey Caroline, I've got a million quid here for you. Um, and that would be, you know, I'd say it's guaranteed, you know, pretty, pretty high likelihood of you getting this. And she might perk up and say, okay, I'm interested, Peps. But if I said to her, well, you know, all you need to do is to work every minute of your life for the next 50 years um, as an investment banker or, <laughs> or similar, to get this um, and actually her, her calculus, her motivation her, uh, uh, in terms of like her, the investment of her attention over that time might change and she might decide not to do that, which I hope she doesn't. Um, behavioral economics economists have known for quite a long time that a um, good way to motivate people is to just reduce the level of, of, of effort and investment required. 
because that tips the, the equation in, in the favor of it. However, again, another hard thing that's to pull off in school because as we know, learning needs to be effortful and, and learning is learning of the stuff we teach in schools is effortful by its very nature. And so uh, we, we don't just want to make the things we teach easier because students won't make as much progress, they won't learn as much, nor will they get that feeling of proficiency. So how can we make things easier? How can we tip that investment calculus? Well, this is where routines come in because the more we run routines and the more habitual and automatic we make parts of the school experience, the less effort that our pupils have to put in. And in particular, this is the really important bit, if we can help our pupils to, or we can build routines around the how of learning, we can allow our pupils to spend more attention on the what of their learning. And so we can run routines around both behavioural sides of teaching and instructional sides of teaching. So for example, we can set up a routine that helps our pupils to come into the classroom and get set up really quickly. We do the same every day. That means they can provide or give more of their mental attention towards the things we're going to learn. Similarly, we can set up a routine in terms of classroom discussion so that pupils know exactly what to expect next and aren't thinking, oh, what's going to happen next? What do I do next? And then can, and instead can think about the content of that discussion and really learn much more. Now, there are lots of great routines out there. Um, you can open a, a classroom door and have a look inside and, and, and grab your own mix of routines. You can read books, teach like a champion. It's full of great instructional routines. Um, you can also create your own if you just script out what you think you should do and then importantly have a trigger at the start or a cue that releases those routines. Um, and then if you are going to establish your own routine, most important thing to remember is you just got to do it repeatedly and stick with it. Often the value that comes with routines doesn't come instantly. There's a bit of a lag time. Um, and so it's very easy to give up early and not benefit from all of the, the benefits that routines give. Anyway, those two levers, sewing success and running routines, paint motivation as very much an economic instrument, one about transactions. But we know as humans that schooling and education and learning is a much more social phenomena. And luckily, we've got Caroline here to help us understand how those social phenomena can mediate some of the success and routines and other aspects that influence motivation in schools. Caroline, over to you. Lovely, thank you. So you might have come across the EAST framework. It was developed by the Behaviour Insights team um, whilst we're looking at how governments can successfully sell their policies to us, the public. Um, it stands for easy, accessible, social and timely and obviously Pax has talked a lot about the idea of making things easy, low, low effort, low cost and actually have the impact of that on motivation but social is obviously this idea that we are social beings, we value relationships with others and if you look at something like lockdown and arguably why that hasn't been successful everywhere, certainly my neighbour, I'm not sure they actually knew that it was lockdown, they've had a good few parties but you know, it is natural and human, if you like, to seek that sociability, that interaction with others. Now, within schools, we often think about social reaction, um, sorry, social interactions, first and foremost, as being between pupil and teacher. And that's perhaps the lever we go to in terms of motivation. You know, one of the thing, reasons I got so interested in motivation was because when I picked up Key Stage 4, I needed to get more pupils going to after school revision. Um, we have a very high mobility school, so lots of our pupils have got gaps in their learning caused by quite fractured experiences of education. So that's a really important way of us helping them um, fill those gaps. And often what I would find was, as I built my own relationships with students, they'd say things like, oh, all right, I'll go for you then, miss. Um, and you can see that they're kind you that actually they're coming because of those positive relationships that as teachers we value and we work so hard to build up but the more I read and um, texts like Graham Nuttall's Hidden Lives of Learners do really powerful jobs of talking about actually the influence of peers on motivation and um, there's a great quote that says when there is a clash between peer culture and the teachers management procedures the peer culture wins every time. Um, and don't we just know that, <laughs> you know, it's all well and good them saying they're, com they're coming to revision for me. Do you know what, if two or three of their mates said, no, nah, come on, let's go home. I'm guessing actually their, their friends would have won. Um, but it's not just about the close ties, you know, they're 
their closest friends, actually loose ties across a whole year group or even a whole school can be really powerful for motivation. You know, I've chosen this image of, of a herd because we don't really always like to stop and reflect about that power of um, conformity, of fitting in, of actually feeling like we're part of the group. Um, and yet naturally it has a significant impact on our behaviours, our mentality and this desire to conform as educators, well, we can create really visible social norms. Now, it is most effective when we pick out the desirable behaviours and emphasise those, as opposed to trying to underline what we don't want pupils to do. Um, there's quite an old blog by James Theobald on Twitter, which I gave back to you time and again, and he talks about how he, he was trying to get his class to do their homework, and he found himself saying things like, none of you have done your homework. And what he's really saying was, if you want to fit in, don't do it. You know, it's normal. It's what most people are doing, therefore. And actually, when you start to really see that and stop and react, how many times have, have we done that in a class? You know, when we're at the end, losing our rag. Right? None of you are listening to me. Um, and there's a great quote in that blog by Cialdini. He says, within the statement, many people are doing this undesirable thing, looks the powerful and undercutting normative message that many people are doing it. Um, and we can flip that on our head. So what I've done with after school revision is really focus on, you know, 96% of you, 57% of you. And you can imagine me stood there in assembly, you know, with my arms demonstrating the vast majority of pupils are attending, are going. And actually what that means is, you know, this is natural, it's normal. And it doesn't stop those quiet one-to-one -one conversations that, you know, we always have with individual pupils, you know, why aren't you going? But it's allowing pupils to see that that is the, the social behaviour, it's the, the nudging the norms. And there's the Matthew effect then um, in failing schools and compound interest in successful schools, you know, success breeds success. And actually, if most pupils are doing the Zara behaviour and that's what pupils are seeing, then it's likely to actually lead to others being motivated to also do it. Now we can also give multiple recent examples um, and over communicate them. So I refer to the fact that I'm on the future leaders course at the moment. And if you've got any experience with that course, you'll know that that's very much something that we hear in many sessions, the power of over communicating. So, you know, again, just going back to that example of revision, it's up on the screens how many hours the year group has been. It goes home in letters to parents. It gets text. It gets put in the school newsletter. Every single assembly starts with me with a graph because, again, it's making it seem natural. It's making it seem normal. Rachel Johnson from Pixel introduced me to what she calls the Weight Watchers principle, which I love. So um, apparently if you go to Weight Watchers, they don't celebrate the kind of one pound that you have lost. They add it all up as the group. Um, so, that, you know, we have lost 25 pounds this week. Isn't that absolutely um, wonderful? And that idea of cumulative effect, I think you can use in numerous ways. You know, I gave an example across a key stage, but consider your own classes. Um, and again, it's just trying to amplify that desirable behaviour and also the approval from peers you know all of a sudden it's very difficult to say oh I'm not going to revision because actually we've demonstrated that the vast majority of you are and it's really difficult for pupils and for adults to place themselves outside that norm um, you know, thinking about the, the change curve that if you've been on sort of a leadership course, I'm sure you've come across, I think it's Rogers change curve, the laggards, the, you will know there's a critical mass. Um, and it is about really emphasizing that sense of what's desirable, which leads me to the, fact to, um, the next lever of belonging. So you can hopefully see the connection between those norms and nudging those, also then breeding this idea of, of belonging and feel like you're part of a group. And belonging absolutely is about motivation, but as human beings, it's also about our health and our happiness. And it stems from affinity. So feeling like people are like you. And affinity grows from familiarity. Um, now that's got a particular challenges when we think about not having seen one another um, for months you know it's now as I said March the 20th and some of our pupils are highly likely not to return to September and I'm sure like my school you would have been trying to think about how you um, communicate with pupils and keep that um, those relationships going and that is really important around motivation and you will want to hopefully start thinking about how when you return to school, how you're again going to build that, that sense of affinity, so build the common ground. Um, something I've reflected on is, you know, I've, don't, you know, 
Pep's pointed out my tan and I have actually had quite a nice, dare I say, at lockdown because my family and friends are happy and healthy. Um, I've got a lovely house and garden where actually I can spend my time. I've had a number of gins in the sunshine. But I'm also really aware that for many of our pupils, this has been an incredibly traumatic time, you know, at the most extreme, um, having to experience bereavement, but also risks around um, unemployment, the stress of really um, dis difficult home situations. And I need to be, you know, think consciously actually about how I build common ground with them. So, for example, something as simple as saying, hasn't this been weird? You know, actually, haven't we missed our lessons together? You know, isn't it great that actually the, the, cafe, the canteen are serving chips again? Whatever that is, to actually try and um, create this sense of that we are the same and that there is this sense of belonging. Now, things that I've done to try and make the people feel included and kind of really emphasise that sense of the collective in the past is creating a shared identity for groups of students. So um, I've met Lead Key Stage 4, so our Year 11s always get almost a slogan and a brand name. We've just started talking about what what we're going to use for the new year and um, the new year group and um, in the past we've used do the work again Pep's mentioned I'm a wrestling fan and if you're I know anything about WE you might recognize that as Triple H's um, slogan but obviously it worked for trying to motivate some year 11 pupils a bit daft but it really did breed that sense of belonging in the year group and we gave it to pupils on a key ring and um, we've got a luggage tag there but sort of representing that idea that though Tara said they were almost branded but we had um, re revision logins apps um, on the back of that keyring that we used. And it was like a visual artifact of their belonging. Um, in our school, we're introducing new blazers in September, which is quite a happy accident. It wasn't something that um, we'd planned to coincide with our return to school. But again, it will be a visual artifact that actually this is our school and we are one. And actually this is a new, almost new normal um, for our school moving forwards. It's really important as well when you're considering this, to think about how you're going to recognise individual contributions to the group, particularly for those pupils who are maybe on the edge. Um, so something that we do is we have gold ties in school and we give them out for progress, not attainment. And what that's really allowed us to do is celebrate some pupils who may not always, you know, again, looking back to you, the first leader, feel successful because they might not be our highest attaining but actually recognising and badging up that they have really put in that effort is a huge motivating factor. Um, and there's been really some, really some memorable moments that I've had over the last couple of years of awarding those quite hideous, I would say, gold ties, but it really means something that, that those pupils feel like they are recognised as belonging to this group of really hardworking pupils. Which brings me to the final lever. So building buy-in. Now, usually um, when we're talking about buying, we do this through giving autonomy or choice. So in Pepsi's new book, it says where, where our pupils feel that are, they have meaningful choice, they'll put in more effort, persist for longer and enjoy their learning more. But that's actually really problematic when we think about it in terms of schools, because our pupils are novices um, you know, and aren't always best placed to make decisions about their own learning. So we can still use this lever, but we need to do it perhaps by explaining the why and the rationale for our decisions. So again, you might have come across Simon Sinek's um, why, um, the circle. Um, in lessons, we can do this by in foregrounding the immediate benefits for the pupil and making it really simple and tangible. So I know, for example, I'm an English teacher and I can be talking about the fact, well, actually, we were going to look at language paper too, but we couldn't really tackle that remotely because actually there's quite complex elements. So we're going to do it now um, and actually we'll plug that gap. So that can really help build trust as well, as we are seen as, as consistent and credible. And clearly that might mean that we have to create a sense of certainty where we ourselves sometimes feel quite uncertain. You know, I, I don't think that we're going to come back in September and actually everything's going to be crystal clear. I don't think any of us necessarily believe that. But what we will be doing is really considering what's going to happen for pupils and spelling it out for them when and why. Now, the image that we've chosen there, you might have seen many of these curriculum roadmaps floating around on Twitter. Um, and I think sometimes they're taken a little bit too literally. Um, I'm not sure it needs to be, uh, have all these wonderful icons, etc. But we do need to consider how we use the power of story and narrative and talk about the journey that pupils are, are going on. Um, and that can make them, again, create that sense of certainty. Well, perhaps they have actually felt um, a real loss of that, um, given the current situation. 
one thing I've done in the past is I've tried to actually make sure every child can answer the question, why do you want to do well? So in our year 11s, we actually have that displayed up on um, form notice for 30 throughout the whole year, and they get a chance to revisit it as well. So one of them that I'll always remember is a lad a couple of years ago, um, his answer, which I definitely couldn't have come up with, was I want to do well because I'm from Slovakia and I feel like um, my friends and family work in factories. Why shouldn't I use this opportunity to actually do something? Um, I think, you know, that I feel more valuable. And I just thought that was so marvellous. That kid clearly had, had really deeply thought about this question. And what it meant for me was that actually throughout the year, I could almost nudge him when he was getting a bit off track to go back to that core purpose. You know, why am I going to that revision session on a Friday when I could go home? well actually because I've got it up there on the wall um, in Pet's book he calls it an implementation intention Ooh, got my got my words around that thanks Peps um, but you know it, it can be as simple as that as I said that post-it note up on the form notice board that can be returned to the other thing that we've done is really be prepared to teach the science of motivation you know why should we know these these wonderful levers and actually not share it with them um, it was interesting when Peps and I started talking about this session we talked about um I was trying to jog more and I don't know if you remember this Pepsi you said well it's brilliant because we know the science of motivation and I thought there's a bit of a challenge and a gauntlet and do you know what it has worked I, I've set myself a routine um, I've joined I've got a couple of friends who've been running who've been whatsapping so thank you to Chris Curtis and Chloe Woodhouse because they're my we set ourselves a challenge that I'm going to join them for a 10k um, but it does work and you can consciously put these levers in place in your own life so why not allow pupils to do the same so we've looked at our tutor time program and from year seven to eleven we're building in some of these things so looking at self-regulation self-talk um alongside giving people some of the academic you know skills so they're also learning about dual coding for example um but you know they are able if we explain and teach them about these things actually to build bring them in themselves as well Right, I'm going to take a deep breath, Peps, and then is there anything that you think I might have missed? I'm also going to turn the lights on, because I don't know if anybody's realised, but it's <laughs> slightly dark. <laughs> the clouds, the dark clouds are coming. Well, there's certainly no dark clouds in, in, in your explanation, Caroline. It was wonderful. Um, now, I don't think you missed anything. In, in fact, I think you covered more than uh, we, we, we could have hoped for. Um, lots of really deep insights, but also practical takeaway examples. So thank you. And I think you really painted this picture of how Motivation is uh, definitely something more complex than we often assume. Uh, certainly, uh, like we can see that a, like a, a poster on the wall or a, an inspirational speech in an assembly is not going to cut the mustard. And so we've got a bunch of more sophisticated strategies, I think, now that we can apply. Um, you've also kind of shown how, you know, I talked about the first couple of levers, securing success, running, running routines uh, in a very like economical way. Um, you've shown how actually it's, it's not just an economic decision that um, our, our motivation is based on. It's hugely mediated by the social environment in which we exist in. Um, so, no, thank you very much, Caroline. That's wonderful. Um, and what that means is we now have um, a kind of a, a full overview of the different levers that we can use to influence motivation. So this is what we said at the start, that we're going to try and give you an insight into what motivation is and how you can influence it. And so here are the, the kind of five levers of motivation. The first two are economic, second two are social, and that last one is much more metacognitive. And so you can imagine that for a pupil in your class, if they felt like that they were succeeding continually in their lessons, and they were getting more proficient and had that expectancy of success, if, they, if you had established strong routines so that they felt this was easy and effortless to do some of the things so that they could really think hard about the content, if they could see that all of those people around them who they respected were doing this thing, it was a norm in their classroom. And those people in particular were people that they felt a connection with, that they felt they belonged to, not just those people, but the whole institution in the school. And if they felt that they had some kind of choice in the matter, that they were bought in to what was going on, they understood the why, then you can begin to see how that as a whole package can really be quite motivated. And so, Together, the, um, what we have here are a set of lenses for thinking about motivation and levers for influencing it. And I suppose together we can talk about this as a motivation for learning framework. And so if nothing else, you can take this away uh, from today. I'll give you a link later on whereby um, you're able to, to, to go and get the image 
Uh, we'll also be like tweeting some more of this stuff on Twitter. I'm very happy to answer your questions on Twitter as well. Um, I think like perhaps the last thing to, to say here is that, well, a few things. Firstly, the, the evidence ar around motivation is just nowhere near as strong and robust as the evidence that under underpins some of the science of learning, for example, from cognitive science. Um, the evidence that we have had to, to pull on to construct this framework is uh, kind of spread across multiple fields. It's not just all tightly packaged up in one kind of science and motivation. And some of those uh, pieces, of pieces of evidence have um, like failed to replicate over the last you know, few decades. And so the ground isn't as firm as we'd like it to be, but the problem is just simply too urgent for us to hang around and wait for the science to, to sort itself out on. There is definitely enough for us to be able to join the dots across fields to be able to make some like best bets in terms of what we think could be useful to do. Um, of course, this is no magic wand. Things aren't going to change overnight if you start like pulling these levers. Um, you know, and changing motivation uh, takes time. The work of teaching is complex. Um, but if you do stick at it and apply these things, um, I, I suspect you will see some po very positive changes over time. Now, this framework uh, will work in school, but you can also use it on yourself. <laughs> like Caroline said earlier, she tested it out with her, you know, trying to get into running a little bit more. And, you know, if you have something like that, you want to, you know, get fit or whatever it is, um, you can think about these levers. So, for example, securing success. Make sure that you don't go out and try and do a marathon in your, <laughs> your first go. Uh, you will, you know, you will not experience success. Like, make sure the first step is one that is really easy to do and one you feel good, uh, you can feel success in. Uh, you know, dr dr drop the bar down enough, go out for a little run and build up slowly so that you're continually feeling success um, and you expect success to come from your efforts. Um, make it a routine, make it a habit, make your running a habit have it set so that you go out at the same time every day so that you don't have to think about anything else. It just hop, happens automatically whenever you hop out of bed or you're finished, you come home from work or whatever routine it is you set up. So um, it just is easy to do. How do you nudge the norms around this? Well, I suppose you could like maybe watch uh, TV programs of other runners so you can like start to see that other people do this and they uh, you know, value it. But perhaps maybe more importantly, it's about breeding that belonging. Uh, like Caroline said, she like twisted some arms of her mates to uh, set up a bit of a WhatsApp group so they could encourage each other. And she felt like she was part of something, uh, was doing something with people who she felt familiar uh, and connected to. Um, a great way to do that is just to join a club. So, you know, more effective probably than going to join a gym is to join a club where you can go along and there are other people, like a class or a club where other people are exercising because you'll feel some kind of social accountability there. Um, and feel part of that group and have status and all those kinds of things. And then finally, it's always worth remembering that you know, what you do is a choice. And so checking in with yourself every so often, why am I doing this? Why am I running? Uh, so that you can just be really clear. And again, that can help tip, tip the scales, tip the balance uh, in terms of that investment decision whenever it comes to it. So there you go. Um, now you have uh, an overview, an evidence-informed overview of what motivation is uh, and how to influence it. And, and just a reminder that like the prize here is, 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 is worth it. Uh, if we can do this, we will end with pupils who um, pay more attention, put in more effort and persist for longer in the classroom. And you know, that is, is, is definitely worth it. And alongside strong curriculum, uh, good behavior management system across your school and great teaching, you will able, be able to uh, help your pupils learn more, which is the, the ultimate prize for, for us in education. Um, this is best seen as the start of a conversation. Um, you know, the science of motivation is nowhere near cracked. We have just opened the tin of beans. That's the worst analogy ever. Are you back, perhaps? I think there was a slight technical difficulty then. The, my, um, somebody has asked about it. My analogy was so bad, Caroline, that it actually <laughs> broke the internet. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, I was, I was just going to say, we're we're kind of we're, we're seeing this as the the start of a conversation. Um, you can pick up this conversation with us on Twitter. There are our Twitter handles, and of course, you know, you, there's you head over to Ambition where you can get more involved in the summer series, but also uh, think about like joining one of our programs. Um, earlier on, Caroline mentioned she was part of the Future Leaders program. Um, Future Leaders 
is a two-year leadership development program for senior leaders um, who are like two to three years away from headship and are keen to learn the skills and uh, get the expertise needed to lead a school in challenging contexts to help close the disadvantage gap. Um, the program is heavily subsidized by the DFE, making it great value for like leaders all around the country. Um, there's a deadline coming up on the 19th of June, which isn't far away. So make sure you uh, find out and apply soon if you're interested. Um, and then yeah, make sure you check out the rest of the summer series. The next one that's coming up is uh, a session by let's see, is Melissa Tomlinson, who is going to be talking about curriculum. And that will, I suspect, be another interesting one. Um, last things to say from me, really, are that, uh, again, start of a conversation. If you want to uh, know more, then here are some things you can read. We scratched the niche. And um, there's a link at the bottom where you can go directly to it for the links. Uh, there are some academic papers there. There are some books that are useful. And there's my book in all its glory, which isn't out yet, but hopefully will be in September, all being well. Um, so yes, it would be fascinating to hear your thoughts if you do end up getting a copy of that. Um, right, Caroline, I think we're done. Do you want to Wonderful. tackle a few questions? Absolutely. So there's quite a few around whether this will be shared as a recording. Absolutely, yes, it will. Um, I'm conscious I've got a sign on the door saying, because I'm in school, please don't interrupt live recording. So yes, for the person with the three-year-old, yeah, absolutely, and the technical difficulties. And um, just to emphasise, like Pat says, um, we're both really active on Twitter. Mine's just at Mrs. Spalded. So somebody's asked about I'm ahead of year 11, yeah, please do get in touch, you know, and if there's any additional things I can give around specifically stage four strategies, I'd be really happy to talk to people. Um, same with somebody's asked about the James Theobald blog, I will tweet that out the moment that obviously we're offline. Um, I just want to pick up one by Gabrielle, so she said there's a constant deficit narrative at the moment about attainment gaps, especially for disadvantaged pupils and their learning loss. Now, I wonder whether this is going to affect the motivation of the pupils coming back. Um, this is something I feel really passionately about. Um, the school that I absolutely love to work in um, is over 50% low prior attainment anyway. So, you know, we've heard this phrase, the forgotten third for the last few years. Um, and actually for us, if you take it to mean that they're not going to achieve necessarily grade four and above, we're talking about... Um, almost I think it's 80% of our pupils um, and as Pat has, has really talked about that low attainment can impact on motivation so we need to reframe that as educators and actually there's a huge opportunity here you know we set the culture of our school as senior leaders and we can choose actually whether we what, what we celebrate how we celebrate it how we make our pupils feel successful so I think probably as adults, to be honest, we're more attuned to those national discussions. I'm not convinced that all of my year sevens, eights and nines are sitting down to watch Boris Johnson's um, live report at five o'clock and good, quite frankly, but let's try not to be too political about this. Um, so I, I will very much be talking about not in crisis terms and maybe I have those quite conversations behind closed doors with other senior leaders but I won't be saying to them that these are gaps that can't be filled because I, I don't think I personally believe that either um, so I think it is really trying to park everything that's going on I, you know our own self-management I think is going to be really important and self-regulation and actually going about how do we within this culture that we set really make it a positive experience when pupils return that it's absolutely achievable that regardless of what level they are working at and attaining at we hugely value it so like i've said you know our school is built on progress from starting points um, i'll also just mention that um only 60 percent of our pupils have got key stage two data because they often come from abroad or they haven't for various reasons sat those um end of key stage two tests so obviously in the future there's going to be another year group without key stage two data but for us that's quite normal um, and we always set a benchmark because again it, it allows us to treat every child the same um, and really celebrate on what we we think is right you know which is effort and achievement at whatever level that that is for that particular child so um, again want to talk to me more about that because I could wax lyrical all day um, about that particular issue then please do get in touch with me um, via Twitter. Uh, uh, okay I'm going to tackle one uh, a question from Emma Lark. Emma asks, is it true that the whole Masters in Expert Teaching, this is a programme we run at Ambition, has a whole module on motivation where you can dive into the literature and think about how it applies to your classroom context and teaching? The answer is yes. Um, yeah, the Masters programme at Ambition has uh, a whole like module which lasts, I think, a whole term 
basically where you you spend talking about it, thinking about it, being exposed to the literature uh, in huge amounts of depth, depth but also um, have the opportunity to be coached on how you apply that to the classroom and get feedback to make sure you, you do a great job on that. Um, so yes, if you're interested in, in like digging really, really deep, then uh, and having this transform your practice as well as other aspects of your teaching, excuse me, then definitely go check out the, uh, the check out the masters. Caroline, do you want to tackle a question? Great. I'm going to pick up two. Um, the first one being, um, Pat's talks about the feelings of failure. So should we as educators be more attuned to well-being um, in our classrooms? You know, so many aspects of what you've be, we've been discussing is around supporting for individual well-being. Um, you know, I really do believe that the pastoral and the academic um, elements of school and teaching are intrinsically linked. And you're right, it is now about, about knowing pupils as individuals. Um, you know, I can't talk about that without, again, coming back to my own school where we have got students with the most varied um, starting points, backgrounds, experiences. Um, and it comes back to simply knowing that that child, as, as I said, it is an individual and making sure that the support and the encouragement is put in there for them. So, so yes, you're right. Um, there was a lovely quote that I also though, sometimes go back to, which is, um, I think it was Daniel Mers, obviously um, head of research at Ofsted, and he talks about that self-achievement, sorry, achievement, and the impact of that on self-concept is, is much stronger than trying to intervene on self-concept and that back on achievement. In other words, what he's saying is, we can't just intervene on, on well-being or motivation or aspiration. We've got to also think about that link to what's going on in the classroom, um, which is exactly what Pep said for that first lever about success. So yes, being aware of people's well-being, mental health is vital, but I think it's wrong to create this kind of false distinction between that and actually how well they're doing in a particular subject, you know. Um, and I'm sure for a lot of people's return to school, if, if we really underline and foreground that sense of success, that will be a huge respite from the real challenges that they've been experiencing at home. Um, you know, I must admit, being back in school this week for me is quite lovely because I, I, this is where I feel so successful you know when I enjoy my job um, and I can see already that for me you know whilst it was lovely sometimes with the carton in so don't presume that actually coming back into school is going to negatively impact on their well-being you might find the exact opposite and I've got to answer the one about who's my favorite wrestler Kenny Omega every time sorry <laughs> okay I do who, who can you repeat that Kenny Omega yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I won't go into it too much. He was wrestling in Japan for quite a while. Now all elite wrestling, but if you're into wrestling at all, you'll know he's number one. Okay, we'll, we'll check out. Be sure to check out Kenny Omega after the yeah. Omega after the after the webinar. Um, Nick Edwards asked, "Are we aware of any useful blog threads on remotivating engaging students post COVID?" Um, I, 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 I'm not sure. There's that much. Uh, out there there's a blog coming um my way i think this evening i've been working on one and um, it's due to go on the ambition site tonight um caroline you mentioned the james seal blog that you're going to tweet uh, later I on am, yeah i'm also um writing a short article at the moment for the saint matthew's research school newsletter so i'll ask their permission i can put that up on my own blog um but yeah we'll absolutely signal um some bits of reading Fantastic, yeah. And then again on that, the link that you can see on the screen, um, and we'll have lots more kind of, not necessarily blog, but like more, more rigorous bits of writing on, on motivation. Um, we've got time for a couple of last questions. Yeah, so I'm happy to pick up one more. So um, with year 10 and 12 potentially returning in just a couple of weeks, what would you think the priorities to address um, are with these critical year groups? So um, this is actually very much around to ask kind of tentative plan and I say it's tentative because obviously dare I say they're going to keep moving the goalposts um, but for us it is very much going to be lines of communication so you know when they first come in is it their form tutor who who meets with them you know establishing that actually there is that sense of belonging um, talking to them about home learning and really emphasizing the positive aspects of what they've been doing so can they bring in work that perhaps they haven't physically submitted as I mentioned a lot of ours is paper based um, and that's going to be our priority. It's certainly not going to be, let's sit down in a classroom and let's try and plug these gaps, which we, we know you've got. Um, you know, first and foremost, when thinking of that, of course, is safeguarding. So uh, safeguarding and then the five levers for us, absolutely. Um, 
if again if you want to talk about more specific kind of plans for those year groups then i'm very happy to talk kind of at length on twitter um, I'd also just briefly pick up, so what are the misconceptions that you often come across when sharing this research with teachers in SLT? Um, for me, it's definitely got to be the idea of the language. Um, it's very easy when you're up against it in February of year 11 to, to slip back into that, that negativity and the big stick of none of you, you all need to work harder. So I don't know if it's a misconception, but that's uh, certainly something we have to really guard against. Um, it did, I, a couple of weeks ago, we were starting to get the sense of some teachers were thinking that pupils weren't working as hard as they would have liked on home learning. And we really had to sort of go back to the statistic going, no, look, actually 85% of them really are working incredibly hard. So I think it's just constantly returning to um, the science and returning to what you know is, is going to work, holding your nerve, if you like. Yeah, and, and just being, uh, as ever, being wary of like transplanting what might look like to just be a really easy and simple answer into, into your teaching. So. Uh, like we, we've, we've seen this with other aspects of the science of teaching, um, I suppose. Um, and there's, it's a great question. Uh, are Hawthorne weight where you are? Um, there's definitely going to be some misinterpretation along the way, I suspect. Um, and probably what we can do best to mitigate that is by all becoming a little bit more um, professionally knowledgeable about motivation, I suppose. Um, but that will take time because, like I said earlier, like the science. Uh, isn't in a great shape at the minute and so it will take time for us as a profession to begin to wrestle with that science and codify it in ways that um, we can apply with with a measure of certainty and confidence uh, in the classroom but great question um caroline thank you so much for taking time out of your school day to come and um, discuss this with us thank you so much for everyone in the audience who has uh, taken a bit of time out of your day to come and listen to us talk about motivation. I hope it has been useful. I hope you have some takeaways around what motivation is and how you can influence it. And I hope the, uh, the rain's just started here. I hope you have a great rest of the day and manage to keep topping up that time uh, as you head forward. Bye everyone. <laughs>